I'd like you to visualize a verse. Yeah, what does that mean? It means that I'm going to say a Bible passage, and whether you close your eyes or not, I'd like you to see what comes into your mind based on the words of the passage. Are you ready? Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. It's certainly off to a good start, isn't it? Blessed. How can you put a face to that? Who hear the word of God. Maybe you see Mary from the gospel, fresh in the mind, sitting at Jesus' feet. Ah, she's blessed. This is biblical wisdom right here. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. What do you think with obey it? It's like somebody starting to sweat now and the pressure is starting to mount. You're going to walk a tight rope, of, tight rope of obedience over a roaring river and fall to your death if you miss. Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully that's not what obey it says to you. I don't know what you're picturing yet, but I, I think we'll get there together today. I wonder what Jesus pictured. Jesus said those words in Luke chapter 11. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. He has a vision of those people who don't just have the ear where it goes in one side and out the other, but they hear the word of God and they keep it. They hear the word of God and they use it. They hear the word of God and they enjoy it. This is what God has a vision for this and he pushes for this. In fact, I was thinking about whenever God speaks to us, he speaks with the push. He pushes us somewhere. Uh, in another word, it's like, like breathing air, into, wind into your sails. When God speaks, he's taking the spiritually dead people that we are by nature and he's bringing it all to life on the basis of what he says. Like things light up, things live because of what God says. I want you to think about that. Anything that then doesn't live in the word of God is kind of like, like a dead limb. You know, like a thumb you can't use. Or an ear that doesn't work. If you're not thinking about all of God's words and how they operate in your life, and then we're missing out, it's like dead weight. Colossians 1 had a vision, didn't it? Colossians 1... And we thank, give thanks to God that this gospel is spreading and growing. Your faith in Jesus Christ is a fruit of God's words to you. Your love for other people is a fruit of God's word to you. Your patience and endurance in trials is a benefit of God's word for you. And your multiplying the kingdom for his sake is a fruit of God's word to you. You see, a very, this gospel is bearing fruit. Paul says, Colossians 1. Look at what this gospel is producing. Look at what it does. Blessed are those who hear the word of God. They are blessed by it. They bear fruit by it. And they obey it. Maybe even with a smile on their face. That's what I see in Abraham. Now you've got a visual. You have Abraham himself to start this lesson off. You see someone who is where does this come from? Rich in generosity and this gracious hospitality that he shows these guests. He is a man of God firing on all cylinders. He doesn't care what strangers knock at the door. Abraham is ready to serve. Did you hear that? He like wakes up out of this mid-afternoon nap or perhaps meditation in the heat of the day. These exhausted travelers who probably started early in the morning, right? They show up and he's like, what can I, what can I do for you? How do you get there? Well, God had been working on Abram's heart for chapters, if you can refer to it like that. He'd been working on him through a number of different stories ever since Genesis 12. I'll make you into a nation. Nations and kings will come from you and you will be a blessing to all people. I'll make you a blessing for all people. This is bigger than big. It gives him goosebumps to start to think about it. And then God walked him through the land and says, this land... 
will be the people, the people's land. They come from you, this nation, they're going to settle here. And God gave him signs and symbols to reassure him. And God talked about him having a son. And you're going to have a son from your own body, Abraham. A son will come and, and I'll make you into this blessing. All of these signs and symbols kept coming. And then you get chapter 17. And in chapter 17, God came to Abraham and reviewed everything all over again. Every promise in its every detail. And he said, you know what? Let's change your name. No longer will you be called Abram. You'll be Abraham, the father of nations. Because if you're not a father of nations, then your name is a walking contradiction. But you won't be. And we're going to change Sarah's name too. Sarai became Sarah in that chapter because she also will be the mother of nations and kings. I think it might mean princess, something like that. So he changes their name. He locks it in and the chapter closes with, and Sarah, your wife, will have a child by this time next year. And Abraham laughs for joy. Really? 90-year-old bride and this 100-year-old groom? We're going to have a child of our own after so long. And not just a child, but that God is making a blessing for the world in front of our eyes. And then he went home. Do you get it? He goes home and he's the richest man in all the world. He goes home and he's ready to bow to strangers. He's ready to kill the, the, the tender calf and, and let's make bread cakes and, and, and milk. I love people because God loves people. I can't wait to serve people. You are a person. What can I do for you today? I mean, he is just on top of the world because of everything that God has said to him. This is a word transforming kind of thing, is it not? And then after they have their wonderful meal and service of Abraham, they get down to business God's business, important business that day, and the question came out, where is Sarah? Oh yeah, Sarah, what about her and her faith? Do you know where Sarah is at? This 90-year-old? Do you know where she is? Can you connect with her emotionally at this moment? Where is Sarah? It's probably a good question on a number of levels. In the tent, that's one. Where is she? Probably be good to review what she's been through. I will make you into a great nation, God had said. Didn't Abram tell his wife? I'm sure he did. Did he start to call her by her new name, Sarah, too? And say, and call me Abraham? This is what God said a couple days ago, perhaps? I think so. He told her. But did she believe it? She was 65 when this adventure with the Lord and being a great nation started. 65 years old. Ten years pass. We're going through her monthly cycle. No pregnancy. No pregnancy. No pregnancy. No pregnancy. Ten years. No pregnancy. So she says to Abram, the Lord is keeping me from having children. So have an heir through my servant, Hagar. What's going on inside in those words? Has something died for her? The possibility of being like a, a, a crucial element in God's plan is now more sidelined for her, maybe a little bit more distant. I guess I'm an observer in this. And she concludes, you have to, we've got to do this before it's too late, right? So have a, have a child with my servant Hagar. Have an heir through her. The Lord, I guess, doesn't want me to be the mother of the nation. Fifteen more years go by. Hagar gave birth to a son, Ishmael. He's 13 years old. Thirteen years go by. And that's when we get this chapter, chapter 17 and 18. 
when God fills Abraham to the brim, changes his name, changes Sarah's name, and steps in to this 90-year-old's life and says to her, where are you? Oh, she's in the tent. She can hear us right now. Where is Sarah? God has come for just this purpose, to breathe this word, to breathe fresh life back into her sails and all the promises One of the angels then said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Moses writes, now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. But she didn't care. She jumped for joy. She praised the Lord. Oh, that's not how it goes. Sarah was past the age of childbearing, so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? She laughed in disbelief. What does that sound like? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Doesn't it just break down any wall? If you are running half pace, are you ready to sprint? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Just to open up the world to you again? Is anything too hard for the Lord? No! No, it's not. God God says, will you think about this crucial question? Have you forgotten me? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah, you're hearing this, right? You're, You're the one at my back. I know you're listening. And then God doubles down. I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And she overhears this in the tent, and you are overhearing it. How many years later? You are hearing it as like a third party to the story, just like she was. But it's about you just as much as it was about her. Because that promise wasn't just to hold a baby in your arms, but that was the promise of a nation. That was the promise of the blessing of all nations. That was the same promise you cling to for your life and faith. That's the same promise that breathes in wind into your sails. As she reaches out a hand to grab onto this, you will have a son and I will make you into a blessing for all peoples and save you eternally. That's all there in the Savior. And you today, we hear, overhear this and we grab onto the same thing. God is giving us the same opportunity as Sarah. Don't laugh. You overhear it. But God is speaking to you today to listen to his promises and run, firing on all cylinders. But she's sick. Ha! Is that what it sounded like? Ha! 90. I'm 90. I'm worn out. I can't bear a child. I'm my Lord. He's 100. This has been done a long time ago. This has been done a long time ago. She has no life. She will allow this word no life. So it is that Satan would lie and stretch things like human age and human ability to such a point that they overcome the ability of God and his timeless power. Is anything too hard for the Lord is exactly what she needed to hear. I wonder today what it's like for us. Probably not sitting there thinking to yourself, we're not sinners. I deny God's word that we are sinful. Or I deny God's word that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. You're probably not saying to yourself that this morning. But there may be words of God that you still wrestle with. You know what it's like to have a fly in your house in the summertime and you're like driven crazy until you kill that sucker? Imagine if that fly turned into a thousand monkeys running wild and tearing everything to pieces. It's the same house, whether it's a little lie or a big lie, and it spreads. It gets worse. When Satan gets his foot in the door with Sarah, that she has, to, she has to assume this must be impossible and reject the word of God on the basis of her age and her ability, 
that's no stopping her from rejecting other things that God has said too. You're throwing a stick at the same piñata, whether it's this promise or that promise, this word or that word. People today talk about moral things. We have this natural knowledge of God. It doesn't always function that well. So people are free, freely engaged with you on what is right and what is wrong. And they have their opinions on what loving relationships should be allowed to do under the law and should be treated fairly like marriages. Or other, as long as we love each other. Or the quality of life, end of life issues. People talk about moral things and they emphasize the word quality. Or they emphasize that word love in our relationship or they emphasize that word of how I feel about myself inside as opposed to how I look biologically on the outside and they go to these things because they feel like experts and it might get a little foot in the door for you I don't know what to say about this I don't know what word if it's really reliable you maybe lose some confidence in the commandments of God. And the passages about homosexuality and marriage and what's stable for a society. God has a vision for this world. A vision where somebody's mind and body are in harmony with one another. A vision where he would call people to loving, committed relationships and one man and one woman as befits what you see in nature and is good for fostering children, go be fruitful and multiply. God is something entirely beautiful in mind when he thinks about life and its value, regardless of the kind of quality labels we might want to put on it. When we decide to smile or when we don't, God says, cherish it all. It's mine. It's mine I've given to you. I take it away. All these issues, we don't, we don't talk about them or discuss them with authority on our own. We say it because God says it. We have the courage and the boldness to speak and engage and cast a vision before other people. This is what life in the word could be like because it's a life in the word because it comes from God and not because it comes from ourselves how blessed blessed are those who hear the word of God God has a beautiful vision of blessings to share and this is a good reminder for us of how Satan would tear down the foundation bit by bit even if he starts at the most insignificant of commandments in our eyes Brothers and sisters, there's a way we stand in the word of God and run with it just because God says so. Just because he says so. That we'd always be children of a promise before the womb gets bigger. Why not let Sarah wait it out? Just discover for herself what God had done. No, don't laugh today. Don't laugh today, Sarah. I'm going to deal with this. Martha is not going to get this if she doesn't spend time with God's word, but Mary will, where the word of God is going to come and look at you and deal with your deadness and help you see it so that Sarah wouldn't be running in her mind an attack on God's promises based on her age and her ability, but she's going to start to attack her laughter. And she's going to see this promise is limp, at my side because I will not believe the word of God I'm laughing at something I shouldn't laugh at it's not too hard for the Lord it's not impossible even though I'm 90 years old and God is helping me see my sinfulness and see the way that I treat his word with so little respect may I run into it may I sit at his feet and soak up the entire vision that I might be fully alive and ready to bow and ready to serve and be all that God deigns for me to be and calls me to be by this gospel that I might not quiver at any word or shake at anything that God says yes kids angels protect us every day and yes I do have the forgiveness of my sins from something that happened 2,000 years ago 
Every word ultimately then becomes something that draws you to attack what's appropriate to attack and to live a life that is the only one to live. It all takes us back to Christ. Sarah, come back to who I am as your God. Don't run the impossible train because nothing's impossible for me. Another way to translate that is, is anything too wonderful for God? Things are just over our heads, too wonderful for us, but is anything, is there a mystery for God? There's no mysteries. There's nothing too wonderful here for him. And he reveals, he reveals the mysteries to us as he sees fit. So we might be animated by them all and live. In chapter 21, a frail son was cradled in Sarah's frail arms. And she thought to herself, it's too wonderful for me, but it's not too wonderful for God. And she says out loud, God has brought me laughter. God has brought me laugh a different kind this time. God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Everyone who hears. Blessed are they who hear. Now you can see it. Sarah with her child. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. I see it. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat>